Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Hope One Live. We're live with 1130 a.m. Eastern Time. We're trying to bring you hope because there's only two things you can have in life. You can have either hope or despair. And just about every day we're bringing uh, an expert on to talk about how we can get hope from a different different realm of reality. Today it's going to be science. And my friend Doug Axe is the director of the Biologic Institute. And he's also a professor at, at Biola University. He wrote a, an amazing book a few years back called Undeniable, How Biology Confirms Our Intuition That Life is Designed. We had Doug on the podcast a few years ago about that. He's been on actually a couple of times. And uh, so you can check him out there. And uh, I want to start by just bringing Doug on. Doug, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, Doug, Give uh, our our viewers here a little bit of background about you. I mean, you went to UCAL Berkeley. You have your uh, PhD at Caltech. How did you get interested in biology and even now the coronavirus? Because you and Jay Richards and one other gentleman are about to write a book on this topic. How did you get into all this? Well, I it, it's kind of an unusual path to biology for me because I started off in engineering. At Berkeley, I studied chemical engineering went on to do a PhD, but as I was starting my PhD, I fell in love unexpectedly with, with biology. Um, wasn't very interested in biology because of my high school biology experience. It was just a boring subject to me. But when I saw how it connects to, at the molecular level, when it connects to things like computing and engineering, I suddenly got really turned on by the subject and decided to take my career in that direction. And then also had an opportunity to go to Cambridge and really felt a calling to put Darwin's theory to the test. So I spent decades on that and joined with others to do some rigorous testing of whether um, whether Darwin's theory, whether mutation and selection can invent new things at the molecular level. Got very, very clear answers to that. So that's what led to me writing the book. And then on the virus, just like everyone else, I was caught up in this thing. My life was going along just beautifully, my normal daily routine. And suddenly, very quickly, but in a couple of different steps, I saw my life being changed by these rules, by these um, you know, measures that were being implemented at the top level and everyone following suit. And I'm not saying they shouldn't, but we're all living a different life now. So that's why I'm talking from my new bedroom office and not going. <laughs> to do lectures anymore. I'm having to do it through uh, Google Meet. Um, and at the same time, I was just looking at the numbers because um, this, the, the, the magnitude of this response is so extreme. It's beyond anything I've ever experienced in my life. And even in my parents' lives, I mean, my parents were born, um, were little children when World War II was happening. And they tell stories of measures that had this sort of feel to them, blackouts, brownouts, um, rationing. Uh, they didn't say anything about toilet paper being rationed, but we've seen all of these things, extreme things. And I'm wondering, um, is this a virus that really calls for this extreme uh, a response? And the more I dig, the more I, I think, no, it's not, which makes this whole thing very, very peculiar. Yeah. And as you just said, we're Christians. We're going to obey what the government tells us to do uh, unless they tell us to sin or unless they tell us to not do something that the Lord tells us to do. But on the other hand, we as responsible citizens want to make sure uh, that we are expressing our views based on the data that we have, because you can't take risk out of society completely. And I've had a medical doctor on this show, Doug. In fact, I'll have him on again Monday. His name is uh, Dr. Dan Eichenberger, uh, and he's treating coronavirus patients right now. And uh, he has said, and I'll ask him again on Monday, but he, on two different occasions on our podcast, said he thinks more people will die from the economic impact of this than the medical impact. And I'll see if he still thinks that, given recent developments. Uh, but I want to ask you, my problem is, is that I see so much conflicting advice out there and so many conflicting uh, storylines or conflicting uh, articles on this. I really don't know who to believe. Uh, how, 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 who do we believe? Where do we go for good information on this? 
I think that's going to be a struggle for everyone. In some respects, um, the glut of information in social media and traditional media is just a cause of confusion because everyone is saying everything about this and you have no idea who to believe. Um, I think this is one of those things where if you can calm down and actively search out um, credible voices on two sides of a controversy, and this is sort of general advice, something happening that has an element of controversy to it, don't just fall in line with the official voice or the orthodox position. Because very quickly, things get polarized, and one position is galvanized as the orthodox one, and everyone else is vilified. But if you do your work, and all you need is Google and a computer connection, internet connection, um, you can look for credible, expert, careful voices on both sides of all of these controversies. And that's the best way to find out um, what the relevant information is, is if you're reading on both sides and then making your own decision. It comes down to this, I think, with something like these drastic measures. I think you would have to be a lot older than me to have lived through anything that comes close to this. You'd have to have been alive through the Great Depression or through World War II, which I wasn't. Um, and therefore, you should be asking yourself what there must be a very extreme public health risk to justify this extreme response. So where is that risk? And I think if you compare it to World War II, for example, and my, my family spent a good number of years living in Great Britain, where um, a country that was ravaged by the war far more uh, drastically, painfully than the United States was, because it was happening right over their soil. Um, people in London were having to daily go down into the underground mm -hmm. tubes for bomb shelter, use those as bomb shelters. Why? Because the Germans were sending buzz bombs over London every evening and they could hear the bombs blowing up. And when they came out of the tube, they saw the destruction of the bombs. So there's no question in that situation that there's a very real threat. Nobody had to bring in an expert to give numbers and calculations. Everyone can see the threat. In this case, what the general public is, is experiencing, what we're all experiencing is the extraordinary uh, extent of the measures. We've all experienced having to stand in line to get toilet paper or to get eggs or to get milk. We've all experienced going to a grocery store and found empty shelves, which is something that we've never seen before. But we haven't seen um, bodies being laid out the way they were in during the Spanish flu epidemic or, or during the bubonic plague epidemics where every neighborhood had casualties. Every household came close to having casualties. A third of Europe wiped out by some of these worst epidemics. Um, we have not seen that. So all we're getting instead is these news feeds, horrific pictures coming from China, pictures of bodies, but you can always see pictures of bodies if you want to. So it's got an element of something that's been overhyped and where there's a media role in feeding the fear because fear sells copy, fear sells newspapers, mm. fear sells stories. Well, you'll be vilified for even saying that now, Doug, just to show, <laughs> just to show you how how polarized everything is now. If you don't toe the line and say the end of the world is near us, then there's something wrong with you they're going to say. Now, you and Jay, Jay Richards and William Briggs wrote an article about a week ago on the stream, stream.org, great site you ought to go to, stream.org. And the title is Why COVID-19 May Be Less Deadly Than We Thought. So from a science perspective, what do you say in that article? Why do you think it might be less deadly than what people are saying? Well, if you look at, um, and I want to say, first of all, death, is that a serious matter? Of course it is. Right. Um, as believers, though, we have to recognize that every time a child is born, that's a guarantee that there's going to be a death. We all, life right. ends in death. So this is not a question of, I'm not questioning the seriousness of death. What I'm saying is what makes death so serious is the seriousness of life. And so when we're balancing the risk of a virus uh, against the cost of a response, we have to remember that we actually value life. And that's why death is, is significant. 
So when our mm-hmm. response is actually harming life, maybe we've gone too far, or at least that's the point where mm-hmm. we have to ask, is this really worth the cost to our livelihood, our way of living and to life in the name of um, stopping death? Because in the end, we're not going to stop death. It's going to happen. People mm-hmm. do die. Mm-hmm. So um, in the article, and I can even update numbers, if you just look at some numbers, they help put into perspective numbers that are being fed to us every day, multiple times a day by the media and by social media, that people just don't have a background to make sense of. So here's an example. Uh, COVID-19 is attributed with 2.2 thousand, so a little over 2,000 deaths in New York State, okay? Every right. year, the average death toll in New York State from respiratory failure is 12,000, okay? So some right. six times the number that have been attributed to COVID. In Italy, which we're all seeing as the worst case scenario, uh, a little over 12,000, 12 and a half thousand deaths attributed so far to COVID-19. But in an average year, 42,000 people die of respiratory failure in Italy. So it's not even, it's a fraction of the normal. In Washington state, which was my own home state, where the sort of US epicenter was up in Kirkland, in fact, I lived in Kirkland and that's where this um, elderly home was where so many people died. But if you look at larger populations like the whole state population, so far 250 deaths attributed to COVID-19 in an average year, Washington state loses 4.2 thousand, so 4,200 people to respiratory failure, and that would be either chronic or acute. So in all of these cases, and you can go down the list, look at Germany, look at UK, look at Sweden, look at Denmark, look at uh, South Korea, look at all of these examples. In no case does the number of COVID-19 attributed deaths um, reach the level of a standard annual death toll due to respiratory failure. And that's how COVID-19 would be causing deaths in cases where it is, would be respiratory failure, pneumonia-like condition. But absence, in the absence of COVID-19, you have, I think that figure you used was 42,000 deaths, say, in Italy to respiratory failures. Is, failures. is COVID-19 adding to that 42,000, do you think? Or is it, at the end of the year, is it going to be around that number? I mean, I, I guess that's really the question. How much how many more deaths are we getting from this virus otherwise, than otherwise? That, a lot of people ask that question. I'm going to say that's not as important a question as they think. Because okay. if you add 12,000 to 42,000, you get 54,000. If we go back a few years, you'll find 54,000. That is not an extraordinary surge in deaths. Now, if mm-hmm. instead of 42,000, you were having 2 million, that's a huge surge in deaths. This, I think the fact that the COVID numbers don't measure up to the standard numbers tells you it doesn't really matter whether they're adding or not. I'm not saying the deaths don't matter. Of course, every death death matters. I'm saying this is not panic, a panic situation. This is not a situation that merits sort of response that we're seeing because it's in line with typical numbers of deaths per year. The average citizen does not go around with these figures in their head. They, they don't know how many people are supposed to die, how many people right, are supposed right. to die. So when they hear that thousands of people are dying, they freak out. And that's really what the media is trying to get people to do is freak out. That's what social media is trying to do, get people to freak out. Everyone wants to go viral. And it's a it's a selfish phenomenon because you end up harming the entire society by um, participating in this news frenzy that's not helping anyone in the end. Yeah, I, I mentioned yesterday that for every news report you see in the news about somebody dying, uh, there are more than 99 cases, stories that have never been written about people who have recovered from this because the death rate is probably far less than 1% because there's so many cases out there that haven't even been counted where people have recovered. Uh, So it does definitely lead to a news frenzy, and that's part of the problem. But Dr. Fauci, who uh, is on Trump's team, and uh, a other lady by the name of Bricks, I think her name is, or Burks, they said, you know, we could have 100 to 200,000 deaths from COVID virus uh, this year. Do you think that is exaggerated? Do you think that's possible? Would that, would that add to the normal flu deaths we get, which probably average about 50,000 a year? Is that going to be another 
100 to 200,000 deaths? Or is that just part of the, 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 the flu deaths that we're going to get anyway? I think uh, realistically what people should do, what I'm doing, is you take, there's sort of two categories of res respiratory, respiratory failure deaths. One is called chronic. So it's people who have lower respiratory chronic diseases. Um, they're walking around at risk for death by pneumonia because they've already got an issue in their lower uh, respiratory tract down in the lungs. And the other is acute respiratory problems. So that would be pneumonia and influenza. If you add those two numbers together, you get a realistic um, idea of what a typical year looks like uh, for deaths attributable to respiratory failure. And these are the people, that, it gives you an idea of the size of the subpopulation that is vulnerable to dying every time the flu goes around, every time something like the flu goes around. And I'm not denying that COVID-19 is contributing to these deaths. It's just that we need to have a scale for what is a typical death toll to that kind of um, demise, to respiratory failure. And if you do that and look at the United States, as I said, for New York, the number is 12,000 dying of acute and chronic respiratory failure every year, and so far 2,000 plus uh, attributed to COVID. In the United States, it's gonna be a large figure. It's gonna be a quarter of a million or more, I need to do the numbers, that would die of respiratory failure every year. In Italy, I said it was 42,000. We've got like five times the population size of Italy. So if you do a quick multiple 42,000 by five, you're gonna be well over 200,000 die every year in the United States in a normal year um, to respiratory failure. So could the COVID deaths make it up to 200,000 in the United States? Yeah, they could. And probably a good chunk of those are people who would die whether COVID went around or not. So mm -hmm. then you ask, well, what's the increase in deaths? And that's actually, it's a moot question because if you're only talking about doubling a standard number, you're not talking about a, ca a catastrophe that is threatening entire population. You're talking about the normal ups and downs. These things are, if you see a graph of these things, they go up and down every year. So yes, there could be 200,000 COVID attributed deaths in the United States, and that would not be a cause for shutting the country down. Hmm. Now, uh, let me just ask you a question about evolution. Then we're going to go to some questions because you have to leave here in about 15 minutes. In fact, let me forget the evolution question. Get okay. Doug's book, Undeniable, because <laughs> he he covers the topic very well. The book is called Undeniable. Let me let me just go to questions. And if you want to ask a question, you can do it on the Facebook uh, feed, or you can do it on the YouTube feed. But put it in capital letters so we can see it, and also spell it out in proper English. Don't abbreviate because it's really hard to uh, quickly ascertain what you're saying. Just spell it out for Dr. Doug Axe here. I've got a question from a friend of mine. He wrote in, he said, your guest is comparing annual respiratory death figures to one month of data on COVID. Also, the reason the deaths are subdued and not in the millions is because we've been implementing these drastic measures. How would you respond to that, Dr. Axe? I'm not doing one month. I'm doing the total uh, COVID attributed deaths to date. Now, um, it's fair to say, so if part of the question is, I'm comparing one year's deaths to uh, a quarter, because we're now into April. So suppose we've had a quarter of these deaths from COVID. That's true, but these things always go in cycles. There's a peak right. in the spring, and then there's a second peak. So the numbers are still, the, the numbers that we're getting uh, in terms of deaths attributable to COVID-19, and there could be some errors there, they are not of a scale, this is what I'm saying, they are not of a scale that suggests that something absolutely unprecedented is happening here. And the response is absolutely without precedent. That's what I'm saying. So okay. even if you add these numbers and none of these people would have died otherwise, which is probably not the case. If you look at the, if you look at Italy, the mean median age at death for COVID attributed deaths is over 80 years of age. And 99% of the people dying with COVID, tested positive for COVID, have other uh, serious health issues as well. So it looks very much from the Italian picture like a disease that's contributing 
to the death of people who are on the verge or are close to being, they're very vulnerable to uh, any infection that might throw them over the top mm -hmm. and cause uh, lung failure, which is how, how they would die. Um, the second part of the question was, oh, our, okay. So uh, let's just put it this way. If people implement from the top, measures that are extraordinary and are going to be extraordinarily costly. And we're not just talking about dollars here. We're talking about a huge surge in unemployment. We're talking about failure of thousands or tens of thousands of small businesses. We're talking about increase in drug use, in homelessness, in poverty, in addiction, in broken families, suicide, in, crime, yeah. in suicide. Yeah. If you take all that into account, and someone has put us on a path to causing all that destruction, then they're not going to want to say five months down the road, oops, we did a miscalculation. They're not going to want to say that. They're going to want to say instead, oh, it's a good thing we did what we did because the death toll was going to be tens of millions and now it's going to be tens of thousands. Pat ourselves on the back, we did the right thing. But let's think about that. Um, mm -hmm. Is, first of all, uh, the only claim, if we back up, the claim, the, the case that was being made for us to take the social distancing measures was to flatten the curve. Do you remember? It was not to right, decrease exactly. yeah. people who yeah. get COVID-19. It was to decrease the sudden surges going into critical care so that more people could get ventilators and the sort of care they need if they're in a critical case with virus infection. So there was never a thought that this was going to take something that was going to kill tens of millions and reduce it to tens of thousands. That was not feasible. That was never, that was never claimed of social distancing. And then if you look, so social distancing was going to save only those deaths that would be able to get um, the critical care they need in intensive care units with ventilators. It's not going to prevent the public from getting the virus. And that was the claim at the beginning. Same number of people mm -hmm. will get it. It's just that the hospitals will be in better condition to service the people who are in the worst condition if we spread this out, okay? So that does not explain how you go from 10 million deaths to 10,000 deaths. The other thing is, if you actually look at, um, let's be serious here. If you look around, are people taking social distancing rigorously, seriously, so that that might actually explain nobody getting the virus? It's, it's just not true. Um, I was just reading an article uh, uh, yesterday, I think it was in the Atlantic on, uh, St. Patrick's day, March 17th, Boston, New York, Chicago, people turning out in droves for the usual St. Patrick's day parties, thousands of people gathering. So I, I think that is a fiction that is going to be sold, uh, to the public by the people who don't want to admit that a huge mistake has happened, but don't believe it. That makes no sense whatsoever. The other thing is, if our social distancing really has caused a thousandfold drop in deaths, if you actually believe that, then you should believe that we've prevented all communicable diseases during this time. And that's simply not true. Even up in Washington, where they test for COVID-19 more than anywhere, because that's where the hotspot started in the United States, the last time I saw they were coming up with like a 7% positive test rate. So there's all kinds of people who are still getting flu-like symptoms, they're being tested and it's not COVID-19. That wouldn't be happening if our social isolation has totally stopped all communicable diseases. That's nonsense. That is not what's happened here. So let me just go back to something you said, and then we're gonna bring Jorge in for questions. You, you mentioned that the reason we were doing the social distancing was to flatten the curve so so many people didn't get it all at once. But are right. you suggesting that over the long term, whether or not we have social distancing, Everyone eventually, not everyone, but a lot of people are going to get this. But at that point, we'll have herd immunity or we'll have so many people who are already immune to it that we won't surge the hospitals uh, with all of these cases. Is that a fair statement? Well, herd immunity happens either way. The, the okay. sole rationale for social distancing and flattening the curve was if we can avoid a sudden spike like in early March where a very large fraction of the population is having this infection and a fraction of them have it in a very severe form and have to be hospitalized. 
in that case, we would have too many people rushing to the hospital too quickly in order for the hospital to be able to handle it. But if we can spread right. this out, that happens over a period of three months, say, and instead of one month, then the hospitals have a better chance of being able to ha handle um, a, a steady stream rather than a rush of people going to the hospital. In no case was that ever going to substantially reduce the number of people who get the virus. It was all about giving optimal care. Oops, it looks like Dr. Axe is frozen. All right. Uh, Frank, would you like to uh, text him? To All see right. If well, he let's can, see. And maybe he's um, coming back now. I don't know. He's frozen. He's Somebody frozen. from the government didn't like what he was saying. They said, "You're out of here." <laughs> so just tell him to, to to reconnect. Um, All right. If you can text him, I'll, tell him to reconnect. I'll see if I can do that. Um, uh, he, I will disconnect he him. Not be able to hear us. So hold on no. a second. Hold on. This is live, baby. This is this stuff happens when we're live. So hold on. Right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go here. I'm going to see if we can get him back in. Uh, I don't know if I can disconnect him. But if I can, I will, and then bring him back in. Okay. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah, sorry we lost our guest, ladies and gentlemen. But um, while you're we'll doing try. that, um, yeah. hey, let's see. I got uh, I got one for you. It says, is somehow this COVID-19 being used for political gain? That's something maybe you can address. While well, we I, you know, there's in. politics that are always played on both sides on this. And we've talked about this before, that given the advisors that the president has, and as Doug Axe just mentioned, the goal was to flatten the curve. And I think everybody can agree, OK, if we can at least slow down the transmission, that's a good thing for hospitals. It's a good thing for our society. Uh, and so his his advisors are saying this is what we need to do in order to do. That. We need to isolate people. Uh, and if that flattens the curve, OK, great. The thing that it seems like the media is intent on doing is to say that any suggestion that the, that the, the measures we're taking are too drastic is somehow off limits. We can't even talk about it. Uh, but again, there are so many implications of shutting down an economy. You cannot take the risk of dying to zero at any time for any reason. So the question is, how drastic of a, of a, a situation should we impose on the country? Now, as I said earlier, politically, the president probably has very little choice because it's easy to count coronaviruses, coronavirus deaths. It's not easy to count coronavirus deaths that come indirectly through unemployment, through people not taking their medicine, through suicide, through psychological problems, through through uh, alcohol use is now up 55%, right. a headline I saw this morning. So there's so many other factors that fall like dominoes when you shut down an economy that can kill people as well. So it's really difficult to figure out what to do. And we got Doug back on, at least hopefully we do. Doug, you still there? Been just on my side, I think my computer crashed. No, okay, it, so it was Big go. Brother who said, no, Doug, you can't keep saying exactly. that. So exactly. That's exactly what, what, what we're going to do is uh, is we are going to uh, go to questions because you only have about six minutes left before you have to actually go teach a class on biology. Yes. So, Jorge, give give Doug a question or two. Okay, it says, um, how does the virus end? Do we stay away until a certain time so it goes out? Or how do we know when the time comes when the the virus is gone? If you, there are, there are some wonderful sites that are um, publishing data. Uh, I think one is called worldometer.com and another one is the worldindata.com. If you go there, I would recommend looking at Italy because you could look at South Korea or you could look at China or you could look at Italy. If you look at the uh, daily uh, running, if you look at the daily number of new cases, you'll see for Italy, that it starts very low, it goes up to a peak, and we're just now reaching the point where it's clearly starting to go down. So that mm -hmm. tells you these things are gonna be kind of like a bell curve. They go up on one side, and then you reach a peak, and then they go down. Damn. That tells you that Italy is past the worst of it. They're still in it, but they're on the downhill side of this. And very quickly, you're gonna see numbers going down quite substantially in Italy. 
So the same sort of curve you'll find in the United States or in your own state or wherever you are, there'll be a, a, a period where it builds and then it will peak and it will stay kind of at that peak for a few days, maybe a week, and then you'll see that it, it drops off. As it's starting to drop off, um, that's a sign that you've got herd immunity kicking in, that the, that the disease has, enough people have become um, immune to it by going through it and getting antibodies that it's, it's having a hard time propagating as a virus and it's starting to trickle out. Good deal. I got another one here. It says, uh, Steve says, did the late or the poor data from China skew the response to be overblown? And do you trust the data that we're getting now? Data from China, I'm China. presuming. Um, this is this is a big question. Um, the one thing I would caution people, there's been this obsession with the uh, case death uh, or case mortality rate, it's called, which is the percentage of people who get the infection who die. And everyone sort of seems to be obsessed with that. And I think it's a fear of, oh, what if I get it? What are my chances of living? That is a very unreliable number. I would pay no attention to that number at all. It's so unreliable. And simply look at the number of people in these different large populations who are dying and their death has been attributed to COVID-19. And if you look at that, you see that these numbers, as I've said, are in line with what happens every year with the flu, what happens every year with chronic respiratory and acute respiratory disease. There's, in other words, people die and that's serious. But this is not a sudden killer that's come upon us that's going to threaten to wipe out entire populations. It just isn't. Look, look at the numbers. Let's see. Got one here. I don't know if I can understand it very well. Maybe you can. Uh, it says, what would happen if you never get infected, you know, and then when the infection rate is lower than the recovery rate, and then you go outside and catch it? happen if you never get it when it kind of surges through the population right. and then you go outside and catch it well yeah i imagine that you don't develop this this uh, uh defense mechanism right and and you right. catch it later yes well point one is once there's herd immunity you're much much less likely to get it because the only way these things propagate through a population is by one person early on every person who has the infection um, spreads it to uh, several others. Sometimes it's three others. So on average, each infected person infects three more. And that's how this thing grows so dramatically. Every person ends up infecting three more or four more. Suddenly you get thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even millions who have one of these infections. But once that's passed through a population, it's much harder for a new infected individual to pass it on to others because so many of the others are, are already immune. They've already They've already had it. So that's an answer number one is you're much less likely to get it once herd immunity kicks in. Answer number two, and this is the one that I think should bring even more calm, is if this is not a killer virus that is threatening to wipe out a huge fraction of the healthy population, then you don't need to worry about this any more than you would worry about a normal flu virus. And it might end up in the end that this is one of the worst flu viruses we've seen in 10 years, but we don't have this kind of panic over a flu virus. And all of them do have casualties. People who are vulnerable do mm -hmm. die. People who already have issues, who are vulnerable to respiratory disease do die of the flu every year, but we don't have this kind of response. So the main thing would be, um, don't view this as something that is far more deadly than a normal flu. If you go back you know, in my lifetime, there was something called the Russian flu that took about three, killed about three quarters of a million people back in the 1970s. I don't even remember it. I just read about it. There was no big deal. There was no huge, um, you know, public measures put into place. It killed more, very likely quite a bit more than COVID-19 will kill. And it, it was not even, it was not newsworthy in the 1970s. Hmm. Doug, let me ask uh, you one last thing. You've got to go in uh, just yeah, a minute here. Yeah. Uh, what kind of hope, other than what you said here, would you like to leave with our, our viewers here? Where, where should they go for reliable information on this? Obviously, we say we're going to do what the government tells us to do, but the, the level of panic has really got people worried. So what, what, what party thought do you want to leave with our, our folks here? Well, um, if we have 
largely Christian uh, viewers, well, for everyone, whether you're a Christian or not, I think Jesus is the answer to fear and is the answer to death. I mean, in the end, maybe it's a good lesson for us to learn that death is real because we try to forget that. We try to go on our lives as though yeah. we're not going to die. And that's just false. We're going to die. Death happens. But we're here to value life. And even um, Jesus offers us life after this life. So death is not the end. It does not have to be the end. To those who follow Jesus, it's not the end. We're here to do something with our lives. So we should really be focused more on how do I live rather than am I going to die? That should be that should be our focus. And there's a lot of scripture that gives, that should calm the nerves in times like this when everyone's um, being sort of tempted to focus on death when I think we're always supposed to be focused on life, not on death. Well put, friend. Thank you so much for being on the program. And people can follow you on Twitter. We have the, uh, the Twitter uh, coming in the ticker here. And uh, you got to go okay. teach a course on biology. Yep. Okay. So thank you so much for being on and okay. giving us your perspective, Doug. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. God bless. That's Doug Axe, ladies and gentlemen. His book is Undeniable, which you can get uh, on Amazon or anywhere fine books are sold. And maybe they're only sold on Amazon now due to the fact that all these other stores are closed. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we, we were going to have Steve Meyer on. We, we mentioned that yesterday, but it turned out that it would make more sense to have Steve on in a later date. So we had Doug right. on right now. We're going to have Steve on. I think it's April 14th. And he'll get more into this issue of what are viruses and did God create them and are they designed and how do you detect them? And if God, why evil? We'll get into all that at a later date. But we wanted to have Doug on now because he, Jay Richards and William Briggs, are writing a book right now on this coronavirus so uh, we thought it would be good because uh, that's really the topic uh, of, uh, of the day right now, the coronavirus. So we can go to questions now. If I can answer any questions, I might not, I don't have the scientific background that Doug has, so I might not be able to answer some of those. But if you have general questions on anything else, we'll just go to your questions right now. So what do we, what do we have here, Jorge? Frank, I got a, a good one here, and I think this one uh, it's, is relevant for, for this and also general topic of apologetics and life. Uh, the dignity, the sanctity of life, and is how can people be pro-life and at the same time be unconcerned with the deaths of the elderly and the in, immune repressed? That's very important. Un, yeah, I don't think anybody's unconcerned about that. That's not the point. We are all concerned about it. The question is, and what people are asking, again, I got to reiterate, we do what the government tells us to do unless they tell us to sin or, or, or tells, tells, they tell us not to do something the Lord tells us to do. In this case, the government puts these, uh, these restrictions, we obey them, not a problem. But we can talk about them and see if, if we think that they are reasonable restrictions or if they're causing more harm than good. You cannot take risk out of society completely. And what we are saying and what some people are saying and what we're considering here on this program is the is the level of, of restriction causing more problems than the virus itself. That's the very question we're discussing right here. Now, do we have all the answers? Of course we don't. We're just discussing it. And Doug is bringing a certain perspective to this that says, look, when you look at the data, these things happen. You have happen these, these epi epi you have flus. You, we lost 675,000 people in the Spanish flu in, 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 in 1918. We lost almost 200,000 in one month, okay? Mm. Now, that doesn't mean that we ought not take certain action here to try and slow this or restrict it. We should. The question is, how far should we go? And if you just read the media all day, you're going to think that this is the apocalypse, that this is the end of... I just saw an article today on the New York Post, which is generally politically conservative, but the headline was this, Jorge, believe here was a headline, healthy family of four dies in Italy. And then you, you read one sentence in or two sentences in, the healthy family of four was 86 years old, right? 77 years old, and yeah. two guys in their late 50s. Yeah, and they, they had other health concerns. You're going, yeah, well, well, come on. You when you hear that, that you think yeah. you, 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 yeah, you, when you, know, you think this is a husband and wife who are 25 years old with two kids. It's with two kids to three year olds or something yeah. like that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And I, actually, this this ties in into this question here. It says, uh, is the panic happening because it spreads too fast from person to person? I think that has to do with the news going. But I'll let you I'll let you tackle that. Well, the one question of the problems is, is, too, is, is that we're getting conflicting information. That's why mm -hmm. I asked Doug at the top of the right. program. I don't know who to believe on this. You got 
I, I, there was a doctor uh, that Jay Warner Wallace sent me, uh, a video that he did. I tweeted about it a few days ago. He's treating patients in a New York City hospital right now, coronavirus patients. And he says it can't be transmitted through the air unless you're really close to somebody. So if mm -hmm. you keep your six feet away, you're going to be fine. Then I'm reading other people saying, oh, no, this thing can be as uh, uh, far as 27 feet. And then Fauci came out yesterday and said, ah, 27 feet's too far. That's irresponsible. It's like, who do you believe? You know, that's part of the problem. And this other guy, this New York uh, doctor who's a treating intensive care patient says, a mask is not going to prevent you from getting the disease uh, from airborne because he said, unless you're really close to somebody in continued contact, you're not going to get it airborne unless they sneeze on you or that kind of thing. The mask is designed to prevent you from touching your face. Right. Because you touch a hard surface and it, the virus is there, and then you touch your face. That's how you can get the virus. So right. there's just so much conflicting information upon it. Upon yeah, absolutely. Here. And I got one. Gerald Simmons says, why can't we do more testing? And that's a question that a lot of people have because we hear about how long it takes for you to get tested or the different methods of testing and how difficult it is to get it in the hands of the, of the, um, the, the health workers. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, because, um, uh, it's, uh, I don't, I don't have the knowledge to know why we don't have more tests right now, but, uh, I know that they're working on getting more tests. And when I went to my chiropractor the other day, they asked me a series of questions before I went in the door. And one of the things they did is they took my temperature with a forehead meter, you know, mm -hmm. and I was, you know, 98.3 or something like that. So uh, uh, apparently a pretty good test for this, at least once the person has it, is their temperature. Right. Although apparently you can be asymptomatic in the beginning when apparently you're very contagious, according to some of the reading I've done, and not have the temperature. So, you know, it's, right. uh, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's very difficult. Yeah. Now that brings me to for to, for our audience to please pray for our 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 friend uh, Mike Jones of Inspiring Philosophy. Mm -hmm. I've learned that it seems that he has COVID nineteen. Okay. And I want to pray. He's a young man, uh, but yep. that doesn't mean that we don't have to pray for him. I texted him this morning and he replied uh, and he sounded very concerned. So let's pray for him. Inspiring philosophy on YouTube. And his name is Mike Jones. I have another one here. And this is Shannon Girdle. And he's very active on our channels. He says, yep. should I ignore the advice of my physicians? I believe in the Lord 100%, but I also have great doctors with much wisdom and discernment. Who do I believe? Well, all I can say is you, you've got to you've got to believe the doctor that's treating you, but check him out on the internet. Uh, you can send you can drive yourself crazy uh, trying to research everything yourself. But look, doctors are people just like us. They don't have all the knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I remember reading a book. This must be twenty years ago now, called "The Overload Syndrome," syndrome written by a doctor, a medical. This is twenty years ago. And he said um, that you will graduate med school further behind than when you started. <laughs> Why? Because the amount of information that is growing, you can't keep up with while you're in med school. And so it's always outpacing your knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, in, in today's day and age with Google and all this, yeah, you, you can never have enough knowledge. So, Shannon, about the best you can do is 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 – is research the doctor, make sure he's got good reviews, and then do a little research yourself. But you're probably going to have to trust the guy that's treating you. Absolutely. Now, I got this one. This one I think is pretty good. It says, if if this is not a problematic situation, like, you know, everybody's going to die. Why are hospitals becoming so overwhelmed? And I think dog touch on that, but I want you to fill it in and give us a good perspective on that. Well, I, I would ask which hospitals. Tell me which they are. Which mm. hospitals are overwhelmed right now? Because I actually haven't seen a lot of uh, a lot of uh, stories that are really specific about that. Yes, doctors and nurses are taxed right now, but I haven't seen many stories about them being completely overwhelmed. Now, that's one of the reasons we're we're implementing. The president has implemented these these uh, restrictions, and as Doug Axett said, Doctor Axett said, what we're trying to do is lower the curve. Uh, flatten the curve, if you will, because these things do tend to spike at this period of time. In fact, if you look at all the flu data, 
the flu data really, uh, the number of cases of the flu really taper off in April and virtually non-existent in May and over the summer. Yeah, there are some cases, but really the peak is February, March. Once you get past that, uh, generally the flu, uh, the flu number of flu cases go down dramatically. And by the way, I want to highlight that uh, website that Dr. Axe had mentioned. I've been on it too. It's called Worldometer, worldometer.com. And if you go to worldometer.com, they give all the stats just about on anything there. Good. Elizabeth says, do you find it more frustrating that people tout the numbers of deaths from coronavirus but ignore the deaths from the regular flu or pneumonia that far exceed COVID-19? Yeah, that's part of the problem. And the counterpoint to that would be, yeah, but uh, the coronavirus hasn't this coronavirus hasn't been in the human population until now, and so we don't have immunities to it. And so it could spread quicker and the death rate could be higher. And so that's the counterpoint to that. But yes, this is what Dr. Axe is saying. Uh, the flu kills people every year and we never say boo about it when it comes to shutting down the economy. In fact, just two years ago, I think it was the 2017, 2018 flu, uh, flu season, there were an estimated 61,000 deaths from the flu in the United States of America, about 450,000 worldwide. We're not anywhere close to that now with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But as Fauci says, we could get we could surpass that. That's, of course, possible. So, again, it's, it's really who do you believe? But, yeah, the, the, you, you hardly ever hear about flu deaths. Absolutely. We got one here by Randall. He says, how do we define how, how do we find the balance between not worrying and not being, I've just learned this word, so correct me if I'm wrong, lackadaisical about this. Uh, lackadaisical. Well, La we lackadaisical. Yeah, okay. we shouldn't be lackadaisical, lackadaisical, easy for me to say. We shouldn't be lackadaisical about something that the government tells us to do. Again, if it doesn't cause us to sin or it doesn't prevent us from doing something that, that the Lord tells us to do. If they tell us to, you know, practice social distancing and all that, fine, do that. Yeah. Um, but worry is something that Jesus talks against repeatedly, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. What, 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 what does worrying do? Being concerned, okay, being aware. In, order, in fact, in order to, to uh, be beware of something, you have to first be aware of it. So you have to be aware of it. But to uh, consume yourself with worry is just counterproductive. Mm -hmm. It's completely Absolutely. counterproductive, and uh, it, it doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah, I got a great comment here by Angie. She says, thank you so much for actually shedding true light on all of this. God bless you all, and I truly pray this video doesn't get taken down. So thank you, <laughs> Angie, for that. Also, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, I think it's our boy Henta. Watching from South Africa, big shout out to you. Thank you for right. uh, tuning in. And I have several questions over here, but I want to keep on the same line and track that we're discussing today. We also do some questions on apologetics topics. Uh, obviously, we're crossexamined.org. But uh, most of the questions here have been already answered by you or by Dr. Axe before he, he left. Um, let's see, uh, cross-examine when there is no truth or authenticity, the only truth is our faith, but biblical, biblically, we can make sense of all of these, some, some, but hold on, but biblically, I don't know. Again, this is a just badly written questions and then my forget brain, it. move on to the next yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have, um, let's see, da, 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 da. does flattening the curve result in a reduction of people diagnosed or dying from the disease by I would Dave say Mason. If, if it prevents people from not getting treated because there aren't enough ventilators, yeah, of course it would. If you flatten the curve and that means everybody can get treated, then more people will live through it. If you don't flatten the curve and fewer people or some people don't get treated and they die as a result of that, sure, you're going to have more deaths. So that's, that's, really, that's really the main reason behind what we're doing right now. We're right. not saying that we can completely stop this virus. You can't. We're not saying that people aren't going to die from it. They will. The question is, can we reduce the number of deaths during the spike period? That's what this is all about. And mm -hmm. the question that's being discussed on this broadcast is how drastic, uh, 
How drastic do we need to go? Uh, and when is this going to let up? And we're getting such conflicting data right now that it's really hard to make that call. Doug thinks we've gone too far. Dr. Dan Eichenberg thinks we've gone too far. Obviously, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Bricks or Burks, or, they don't think we've gone too far. So there's different mm -hmm. difference of opinion. What you need to do is look at the data. And uh, there are some, there's been some articles by some Stanford epidemiologists, which I think are kind of middle of the road, and talk about this from a more sober perspective. And uh, if you look them up, they think they were on Stat News recently. I don't have the, uh, the link in front of me. I tweeted it probably about a week ago. But those Stanford e e epidemiologists seem to be kind of in the center of all this saying, yeah, OK, it's bad, but it's not as bad as people are claiming it to be in the media. And certainly when you see headlines, like I mentioned this morning from the Washington, from the New York Post, healthy family of yeah. four die and they're in their 80s, and 70s. Yeah. And, you know, you're going, come on. That's just irresponsible yeah. journalism. Absolutely. And we see a lot of that. So mm -hmm. uh, and this is this Frank asked this question, Frank, he says, does the radio of those ill? To those to, that die, Warren creating the global effect or, the, or uh, the global effect on the global economy. And I think that ties into what you just said. You know, are we looking at something that is happening and would, does that warrant us going far, farther than we are right now with, with the measures? Yeah, that's the very question that's hard to answer because, as I say, there are so many, there's so many ripples. Let's talk about the ripple effect again. There's so many ripples that, are, that occur by doing what we're doing right now. There's an increase in alcohol use, an increase in drug use, an increase in suicide, an increase obviously in unemployment, an increase in stress, an increase in heart attacks, all of these things. It, do, do, does it warrant causing all that? Uh, and and it's, it, it's almost an impossible question to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, 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 there are some people in the media that seem that seem to think, oh, there's no negative effects to this, that, you know, this is obviously what we have to do. And that's just not the case. Right. There is a ripple effect here that um, that is really hard to measure. And that's why I said earlier, it's really the, the president's kind of in a no-win situation because if, if he doesn't do this kind of drastic thing and then a lot of people die, people are going to go, oh, look, you could have prevented all these that. deaths. Yeah. But nobody's ever going to say that he caused all these deaths by doing these drastic things. Mm hmm uh, Troy says, during this time, people are in denial of sin, and the body of Christ is obviously, uh, you know, full of this. You know, people denying sin, and unfortunately, that's, that's, that's a problem that we see every day. So how do we present the gospel during this time of pandemic? Well, this is a very appropriate time to uh, present the gospel because people are concerned about their own mortality right now and they're concerned about the purpose of life and why are we here and gee it's, my little bubble world has been interrupted now people are open so you can ask the question to people what do you think happens when you die and just see what they think see where they go with that uh as i said before we all have a virus it's the virus of sin and there's only one known cure and that's jesus and we ought to be getting people that word now is the time when people are Maybe their hearts have softened a little bit and they're a little bit more open to the gospel. So this is a very appropriate time to do this. It's always appropriate to share the gospel, but certainly now you want to share the gospel when people are open to it. And so ask them, what do you think happens when you die? You know, a lot of people are worried about dying. What do you think happens when you die? Ask them the question, see what they say. And then, of course, the question I always ask, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And by the way, tomorrow with Michael Heiser, we're going to talk about a lot of the scriptural uh, issues related to this. We're going to talk about Psalm 91. We're going to talk about Mark chapter 11 and these other passages, which seem to suggest that, gee, you're almost bulletproof if uh, if a, a pandemic comes along. You just ask it and God's going to do it. Is that really the case? So we're going to we're going to look at that with Dr. Michael Heiser. You don't want to miss tomorrow's program. Make sure you uh, click reminder on the post that we're going to be uh, up in a few uh, in all of our platforms. Make sure you get reminded of this uh, uh uh, live stream tomorrow. And, and by right the way, Jorge, we we're also going to talk about the issue. Is this coronavirus a judgment of God? Mm, That's an important yeah. question we're going to deal with tomorrow yeah. as well. A lot of people is, 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 is saying things like that. Now, uh, before we go to the last two questions, you're about to wrap mm -hmm. up. We have about uh, five minutes or so left. Mm -hmm. 
I want to let everybody know that you can go to crossexamine.org, click on online courses, and you can still join the uh, dealing with how to deal with the topic of homosexuality by Sean McDowell. Dr. Sean McDowell is teaching that course, and we also have two courses, half of part of Operation Inoculation. Uh, just go to the online courses. We have Why I Still Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, which is the mo our most popular course, and also Fearless Faith with you, Jay Warner Wallace, and Dr. Mike Adams. Uh, and those are four week intensive courses at half the price. And we're going to be, and the premium version, Jorge, we're going to be live on Zoom right. video answering your questions. So sign up for the premium version right. if you can. So they're not All just right, take, video let's... courses, they are interactive courses with That's the instructors. Right. Now, Uh, what is the level that we must pass to put this in the very concerned or the very bad? Say that again. What is the you know what, what is the level? So if we if we're going up, what is the level that we we need to reach or surpass to to label this coronavirus as something that is very bad or something that we should be very concerned? Well, that's kind of a subjective test, anyway. I mean, what do you mean by very bad? Of course, it's bad. I mean, we all know that. Right. People people are getting sick and dying. What Doug's point is, is, yeah, people get sick and die every year and we never hear about it. Uh, this thing is bad, but it's been overamped in the media. And that's part of the problem. Uh, now, let's say it's even worse than what the worst people are saying. Let's just let's just for the sake of argument, say that. Well, welcome to life, ladies and gentlemen. We're all going to die at some point. Get your eternal affairs in order now. Um, that's our ultimate hope. Our, ult our ultimate hope isn't, gee, let's flatten the curve. We want to do that, but if we can't do that, okay, our ultimate hope is in Jesus anyway. Amen. Right? Last question. Okay, so do you think if this distancing thing becomes the new norm, it is detrimental to our Christian fellowship in that we can't meet in person anymore? Is the option of online you know, services a good idea? Uh, well, it's a good idea temporarily, but we weren't meant to be digital. We're meant to be in the fellowship of others. So I think uh, social distancing is not going to last forever. It can't last forever. You've got to be in the presence of one another. Now, maybe handshaking will be out, and I'm happy for that, because if there's anything I hate in the services, shake your neighbor's hand, say hello. No, let's stop that now. That's a good thing that's coming out of this coronavirus thing. Don't shake your neighbor's hand. <laughs> say hello, but... Uh, But no, you don't have to shake your neighbor's hand. You're just spreading disease around. Yeah, good deal. Well, that's it for today, guys. Remember, we're doing this tomorrow with uh, Mike Heiser. We're going to be next week with Dr. John Lennox. I uh, forgot the rest of the guests, Frank. Uh, we got Dr. Dan Eichenberger on Monday, John Lennox on Tuesday, Dr. Michael Lacona on Wednesday. So don't miss any of this, friends. We'll see you next, next time, definitely tomorrow at 1130. All right. See you then. God bless. Hopes in Jesus. Don't forget that.